Springs, Aaron Christensen. Welcome to Horror 101 with Dr. AC. A gathering place for fellow fiends the world over to discuss all things freaky and frightening. If you'd like to be part of the conversation, and I hope you do, I invite you to like this video, subscribe to the channel, maybe go back and check out some of our previous episodes, leave a comment, and most importantly, let us know the fright flicks you'd like to discuss in the future. That kind of connection is exactly what we're looking for, and it really does make a difference. We're all about sharing the scare, and we want to hear from you. With a screenplay written by Shogun novelist James Clavell, Kurt Newman's version of The Fly focuses on a scientist's wife, Elaine Delambre, who is introduced gruesomely murdering her husband, Andre, by crushing his head in a giant machine press. The crime confuses the police and disturbs her brother-in-law, Francois, who cannot believe that his brother's wife is a murderer. Even more confusing is Helene's obsession with finding a white-headed housefly in her home, leading the police to suspect she is insane, despite evidence pointing to the contrary. The film continues as a flashback, as Helene tries to explain the bizarre circumstances that made her kill her husband. At the time of filming, Kurt Newman was an experienced director with a career spanning almost 30 years, specializing in melodramas and Tarzan films with Johnny Weissmuller during the 40s. All of Newman's pains directing below-the-radar B-movies were finally rewarded when he got a nice budget, enabling him to finally make the horror classic he wanted in the way he wanted. Though its maker wouldn't live to see its success, the film's influence is enormous and had a hand in developing the new gothic-in-color style that came to prominence around this time. I'm very excited to talk about these sci-fi horror classics for a variety of reasons, not least of which being my awesome panel of guests, all of whom have been on the show before. So let's go ahead and bring everybody in and let's talk to Darren Callahan, Dan Caffrey, Eli Lachance, John Kitley. And we are here to talk about The Fly from 1958, celebrating its 65th anniversary Thank you all so much for coming on the show, and welcome. Glad to be here. Now you can talk. <laughs> Excited to be here. <laughs> Having a blast with these. I, I do want to just bounce around and talk about people's first experience with the original 1958 uh, fly, because I imagine some of us maybe saw the 1986 Cronenberg version before they saw the original. Yep, there it is. Uh, before they saw the uh, the original. Uh, but there are some, and we'll definitely talk about both versions, the 1958 and the 1986, as well as the sequels to the 1958 uh, original. But let's go ahead and bounce around really quick. Let me go ahead and start with you, Darren, if that's all right. Sure. What was the first time you saw the Kurt Newman version of The Fly? Well, I was extremely late to the party. I saw it maybe 10 years ago on Turner Classic Movies. I had uh, seen the remake, but... I had never experienced the original and uh, we can talk about how impressed I was with it because it was unexpected. I, I had, I wouldn't say low regard for it. I almost had no regard for it because I like Vincent Price, but yet it had just slipped under my radar. I don't know. But um, that was the first time 10 years ago on TCM in letterbox pristine version. That was a nice way to see it for sure. Let's bounce down to John. Um, I don't remember when exactly it was as, as a kid on TV, both the first one and the sequel, both seeing those on TV and both just loving the whole monster aspect of it. It wasn't until years later when you get to be a little older and you start seeing a little bit more depth into, into the films that you appreciate it on a different level. But as a kid, I, I love those. Yep. Uh, Eli? Uh, my first experience with this movie might be uh, for this podcast, uh, I definitely seen Return of the Fly. I loved it. Um, and so I started watching the fly and my first thing was like, oh, wait, this is in color. This isn't <laughs> supposed to be in color. So um, I definitely seen Return of the Fly. It was on cable. Um, my first fly experience was the Cronenberg movie when I was a child. Um, and yeah, I had a good time watching it. I thought I, I, the, the, the colors, the photography was gorgeous. Great movie. And Dan. Yeah, this is my first time seeing it as well. I remember seeing the VHS box a lot as a kid, um, just with the guy in, 
in a suit with a big fly head on. Uh, but yeah, I grew up on the Cronenberg one and the, the very depressing <clears throat> Fly 2 sequel to the Cronenberg one. Um, know what I do remember, though, was the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror that parodies the original Fly. Like, I remember watching that and knowing that it wasn't spoofing the Cronenberg one, that it was spoofing more of the kind of, you know, man in a monster suit B-movie one. Um, yes, this was my first time watching this as well as the the two sequels. Um, I didn't rewatch Cronenberg or fly Two for this, but I've seen those so many times. So I feel equipped to talk about them. <laughs> You've seen fly Two So many times, well, <laughs> ugh, man, I mean, it's, it's great. Almost, it, it, it's great. It's so, we'll get, we'll get so it. hard. Like, th that dog scene. I mean, that dog scene is like a running joke for so many things now. So I feel like I've pulled up that depressing dog still and sent <laughs> it to friends on group threads more times than is healthy for any human being. <laughs> Uh, I think my first exposure to the original was seeing it, um, well, kind of like Psycho, I had the the big reveal spoiled for me by all the Halloween clip shows that came out in the 70s. Like I saw that, you know, the the rag get ripped off his head and, and seeing his fly head and then like seeing her screaming all the different, you know, little circles of her, which is not how fly eyes work, but it's awesome. It's a great <laughs> cinematic moment. So I'm not going to knock it. Uh, but then I, I eventually caught up with it like on a late night creature features or something, which is why when I saw the trailer for uh, the Cronenberg version and they had the little help me, help me, like just kind of under his breath as the as the credits were, you know, it's like they showed the block with all the credits. I was like, that's cool. OK. And then the Cronenberg version completely exceeded my expectations. I had no idea how awesome it was going to be. But like you said, John. Going back and watching The Fly as an adult, it opens with like a grisly murder. And you're like, holy mackerel, like wh what did she do? And you, you see the blood like oozing out of the press. And you're like, holy mackerel, they are not messing around here. In color. Yeah, you know, which, uh, was not, which is not de rigueur for 20th Century Fox in the 50s. Like big studios were not doing a lot of big color well, and this this is very much a monster movie. It's not like a prestige sci-fi flick. Uh, actually, Dan and I were on another podcast about the Dead Zone and Christine and uh, uh, Cujo. This what podcast very pod, was that I Horror One Hundred and One, <laughs> and uh, it was uh, it was excellent. And Aaron uh, and Dan and I had a great chat about it. But in that, we dropped that Dan had not seen the original Fly because. That's right. Uh, you know, maybe it was silly or something. And we're like, no, it it is like a real horrific um, idea and execution. And I can't imagine what a 1958 child seeing uh, that movie must have done. They must have just freaked out. And I love that. Well, and, and it is pretty close. Eli, we're talking a little bit about this backstage, but it's pretty close in terms of an adaptation of the short story. I read it this morning. It's nearly identical. Uh, I think the only thing that gets left out is that uh, he gets a little bit of the cat mixed in with him trying to reverse the fly process. <laughs> yeah. That's great. <clears throat> Which I Whoops. think they cut mainly because of makeup. They didn't want to have to do more. Makeup. Yeah. <laughs> he is now Andre is kind of a, a he, I mean, like the fact that like the first thing he thinks of is, hey, let me put the family cat through the. the oh, my God. He is such a piece. Of <laughs> I love I love that line where he's like, like, you know, getting ready to have sexy time with his wife. And he's like, that's very you're not thinking very scientifically. Uh, we've been saying that around the house since we watched. The movie. <laughs> it was funny because in both this and the two sequels, obviously very different in many ways from the Cronenberg movies, but you could see what they were cherry picking a little bit from that. And even hearing that there was a scene with the cat DNA, it reminds me of that deleted scene from Cronenberg's with the uh, baboon cat. That's, you know, it's probably yeah. for good reasons. So right. yeah. Deleted scene. That sounds disgusting and cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ooh, it's nasty. You know, if you think about the theme of all five movies, that really stuck with me, just holistically gluing them all together. It was women suffering terrible male choices with science, you know, <laughs> because it was just every single movie, like really the, maybe in the third one a little bit, the woman has made a choice that's a little bit sketchy, but essentially it's a it's a good woman and and not necessarily a bad man, but just messing around with science to the point of irresponsibility. And so the woman always gets the short end of the stick in every movie. And it's, you know, sad. Well, 
and and you're right. I mean, they are really loyal and intelligent, and you know, they they <laughs> they give their men space to do what they need to do, and they just very fuck supportive. It up. Yeah, very supportive for for like the absolute wrong outcome. <laughs> to a fault almost, with the exception of the Gina Davis character. Like, <laughs> I feel like she was sort of sucked down the drain with that version. Uh, but but um, you know, actually, that's one thing that really sticks with me about the Fly movies, particularly seeing them all in preparation for this pod back to back, is there is a lot of sacrifice being made by everybody to not only realize this great scientific advancement, but to realize, you know, the, being the best possible self for their others. And, um, you know, even though cruel things happen because of the DNA of a fly, um, the, it's, it is almost strange to see things where there's very few true bad guys, maybe in um, return, re, uh, second one's return, return of the, the fly. fly. We have a, we have has a, a true couple bad of, guys. Yeah. Yeah. I think Curse of the Fly has some absolute bad guys as well. Well, we'll talk yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah our scientists yeah. for sure. They, they, <laughs> it's hard to defend them. Yes. Just, yes. They're... Just misguided. Not bad. Speak, are we going to talk about uh, Demodex mites or, or uh, back? bacterial dna like why don't they get mixed in with the the fly <laughs> soup that may, like you know why is it is there i mean it's it's analyzing them on the molecular level so you'd think like what what's a man with demodex might molecules gonna end up looking the like? science I mean, is horse hockey anyway so. <laughs> <laughs> None of this is real i mean like, well I'm... to be fair like transportation will be obsolete like the oil industry is probably what turned him into the fly man like they went after him that's they right that's right you're not wrong <laughs> well Hard if time. you're talking about the film or the science theory in the in cronenberg's where even jeff goldblum said it wasn't supposed to be two separate things so the computer decided to do this computers don't decide to do something they do what they're told Especially in 1986. <laughs> yeah, well, even now, they're not, unless there's a yeah. if that or this, yeah. computer's not going to go, hmm, I'm going to do this. Yeah. No. My, yeah, no. my computer will invariably just look at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what yeah. you mean. Sorry. The only thing it decides to do is just shut off at times. <laughs> yeah, it might do it in this pod, so don't curse yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, the science is, is all BS. And, you know, hey, the original 58, it's a monster movie, and they did try to bring some verisimilitude to the 80s ones, but there's it's still complete bullshit. Like, I can't imagine <laughs> anyone who really is a, a scientist working in a lab would see this and go, anything other than I'm leaving. You know, I, totally. I, no, so I, the thing that bothers me most about the, the verisimilitude of the 80s one is why the fuck is he using baboons why is he using such an ex expensive and dangerous model organism for these tests like what were rabbits like did they that, but that's not like a human you know like this is all about sending humans if, if you have a rabbit turned inside out oh my god you'll have people leaving the theater but a baboon <laughs> that's true eh. that's true um right. i'm here going, for the baboon you going, know. going back to the uh, the 58 version uh, something that actually struck me because what is it about science? Well, I guess it kind of speaks to our capitalist nature, but like the fact that every scientist has to keep these under wraps, like we can't talk about this and nobody can know about it. And, you know, it's like, and, and that's the thing that was another theme that runs through is that we have to keep this secret. We can't talk about this, this horrible thing that's happened. We can't talk about it. And it's like, like if they could just, talk about it and get out there and get some help and bring in the people to assist them, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, we didn't, can't have anybody stealing our ideas or can't have people accusing us of being Frankensteins or whatever, you know, but like that, that is also a theme that runs through all of these movies I, is don't talk about it. I think that is a reflection of the sort of atomic fears that most of those 50 mm -hmm. sci-fi movies plan is like, it's all atomic technology is what this is all a cipher for, especially in those early movies. And uh, part of it is like you said, like capitalism, industrial espionage. But the other thing it reflects is just the secrecy of the Manhattan project. And there's the general public understanding of how science works through that lens. And so like, I think that's where a lot of that comes from is like, we can't let people find out because, oh, it's a national security. We can't let people find out because they'll steal it and, you know, beat us to the punch. Um, so, yeah, but I think it's definitely 
partially connected to that sort of atomic roots of the the 50 sci-fi monsters and then i think what happens too right with i mean not just in the fly but with any kind of mad scientist movie is that the goal which is supposed to be the name of science and the greater good of humanity just becomes completely self-serving at a certain point right because they just get obsessive and it just becomes more about i mean in the the case of the fly also you know the the task becomes how do i get this giant fly head and arm off me <laughs> so like i think i think at a certain point at all all any false sense of altruism goes out the window you know you know uh this is not i think eli is totally right about the manhattan project and the red scare at the time that our information could be taken as well as like some corporate fear because things like polaroids and stuff like that were kept really secret at the time because they were afraid of corporate uh, corporate espionage i do find it unrealistic that everyone has a lab in their basement and they've gone this far with a project hey, without co school. quality control but whatever um but i think what's what works to the advantage of the films most of them have a mystery at the start like if you heard the title the fly i guess if you saw the poster it would blow it for you but it is a long time before you figure out what what they're really talking about. It right. begins with a murder of a, a loving wife to a husband. You don't know why. It transitions into the investigation of that murder and her acting strangely, particularly around the sight of flies in the house. Um, and it is really probably 30, 45 minutes in before it doubles back to the original thing that happened, which I always found structurally really interesting in the script, that it lets the mystery be a mystery with yeah. the events already having happened for the longest time before it reverts. I will, I will say, though, I don't know. I, maybe I don't, know, I don't know how Eli feels. And this isn't the movie's fault, right? Because the movie's what, like, what anniversary are we doing right now? It's like 60, 65. Yeah, 65. 65 years old. It was a little bit tough for me watching it the first time just because I'd seen the new one. I, you know, I, I just knew enough about the fly to know, oh, yeah, he's turned himself into a fly that, you know, the reason we don't see his head and his arm because those are fly parts, et cetera, is what, you know, it was hard for this first watch because it is a slower paced movie, especially for a 50s movie, which in many ways is kind of incredible. Like it's not a 70 minute universal monster movie from that time period, right? Like it's like, no, it's like 100 minutes. It's, I like the patience of the mystery, but watching it for the first time, having known most of the story already, it was a bit of a tough sell, especially because the opening is so good because I too was struck by the technicolor blood and just going, wait, when is this the fifties? I don't, I haven't seen any fifties movie. That's this bloody. Um, and then I love the ending too. Like once we get to the monster stuff, it's great. But the middle of me was kind of like, he's a fly. He's a fucking fly. Let's just get to it. But I, I <laughs> don't know. I, Dan, I can't, are, I can't are, the movie are, though for that. Are you are, impatient because of superhero stories like the Spider-Man movies of the 2000s? <laughs> yeah, right. Because that's yeah. kind of what this is, you know? You don't know, um, th th even in the Jeff Goldblum one, like the evolution of the skills or the degradation in the first one, the degradation of the mind. Like, these are things we've seen in other movies now a yeah. lot. So I don't know if that was bringing your disappointment. I think I think it, I think it was the the miss the murder mystery aspect the the mystery of like okay did the, what did she murder him which I knew she didn't and like what it, what's under that hood you know right. uh, but yeah Eli what about you I was all in man yeah. I watch a yeah. lot of fifties movies uh, I'm yeah. really into the slow reveal of the monster like yeah we know he's a fly for sure but we don't know who she killed exactly well, I mean we do know it was him but we don't exactly know how he ended up there if he killed himself if she killed him like the mystery was working for me and the big part of what sells it is the payoff is the fly just looks so much better than just a guy in a rubber mask like there's some life to it it has that iridescence to it which looks great in that technicolor yeah. Um, so like a little the creature, moving pincers that yeah, the, like the that, creature that cool. reveal yeah. like the way it kind of like buzzes a little like everything about that was fantastic and then to watch it slowly become a threat um, so my sensibilities are kind of already ready to absorb the most 50s of 50s monster movies. So I, that, that that wasn't a hang-up for me at all. I really was enamored with it. Um, and it also helped that the characters were so delightfully eccentric, which is something that, that really <laughs> works for when you get a good, like, 50s, 60s horror movie. The characters are very... They're always upper class, but really fucking weird and uh sorry i guess i shouldn't cut them they, have, but, yeah. they have more money than they know what to do with <laughs> yeah well, and, well and, yeah he has his own lab in the basement someone was making fun of that which is absurd but at the same time isn't that unrealistic like we're at that point we're like 30 40 years from when people might have actually like scientists might have just been rich weirdos with a lab so like 
it's not that unbelievable, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I get it. <laughs> you know, Eli, I'm curious. Do you think the film would have been served more or less had they cast Vincent Price as the scientist, not the brother? Ooh. Oh, uh, absolutely less because Vincent Price's whole thing is to underact, and part of part of what made that character work is how energetic he was. And Vincent Price would have made him seem more sinister instead of misguided. So I think I think that their the actor they chose was. I'm sorry, I, I didn't bring notes, so I don't know. David Hedison. David Hedison, great. He did wonderful. You, you'd have to have Vincent Price's <laughs> voice, and if he was to fly, you wouldn't have his voice. You wouldn't have Vincent Price. I mean, you wouldn't see him most of the time. But I think Hedison did a perfect job, and that was mm -hmm. what I alluded to earlier. Um, when you watch it uh, more as an adult, you see his decline of his humanity. And I think Hedison does a beautiful job of slowly losing his grasp on his humanity and fighting the other side of him. And to me, that took a, that. I mean, as a kid, it's a guy with a fly head. That's really cool. But, you know, it's a monster flick. But as an adult, I didn't have a problem with between the murder and the, the discovery of what's going on because of Hedison's uh, his performance. I think that sells the whole movie. But, and it's a but perfect, still... it, it's a physical performance, too. Like it's it's, you know, like he's just doing it. And I love the fact that, like, he had, you have to wait while he types things out. Like, I mean, I just feel like there's some great, there's some great um, suspense. And I, I really like the fact that we spend time getting to know this couple and getting to like them as a family mm -hmm. and then yeah. to watch that fall apart. I mean, that's kind of a trope that, you know, like, you know, that there's a, a romance involved and, and, you know, true love has to try and save the day. But this one feels actually earned. And I don't know if it's because of, I mean, I'm sure it's a combination of the, the, the technical quality is great. Like it doesn't feel like a cheap monster movie. It feels like a, a legit studio production and the performances are really solid. And I think the story is really well done. You know, like it, yeah. all of that feeds into us buying into the situation so that when, you know, even though we know what's under that, under the cloth, we actually like, mm, don't, I don't, I don't know if I want to see that. I don't know if I want to see that because it's going to be a friggin' fly head. You know, the reveals in every one of the movies is always a shock. But I do, I've always wondered in that first movie and maybe in some ways in the second movie, I mean, he could write. He remembers the English language, yet he's got a fly brain in there in his head? Or is that a human brain and a fly I think, thing? I think that's actually what makes it more horrifying is because you know he has his... He has presence of consciousness there that is being overtaken by the fly, which brings into question the fly that's eaten at the end. Yeah. Is, he, is his consciousness being transferred over time, which yeah. is a whole nother horrific <laughs> experience. Um, oh, man. And it's really exciting. I, I, I think that I, I like the, 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 the ambiguity and the strangeness to that, because I think these these sort of people being turned into insect stories kind of thrive in strangeness and if we had it all like answered for us and made made sense it wouldn't be as grotesque and upsetting so i i like I, that aspect i was really um i'll tell you what i was surprised by was the ending with him in the spider web like i did not <laughs> see that coming i didn't think we were actually gonna see close up what he looked like and I, it just feels especially cruel. I mean, maybe not because he did it to himself, but it feels a little bit cruel that he does get eaten by a giant spider and then smash. <laughs> it's, 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 I was like, damn, that's a really... When they take him out, yeah. Yeah, that's a bold move for, uh, once again, 1958 movie. I feel like that's something you would see nowadays. Although, I mean, these this is also the heyday of like EC Comics. Well, maybe not the heyday, but like EC Comics were around, right? With, which have such nasty endings. And um, I didn't read the short story it was based on, but I can't help but wondered if it was inspired by some of that darkness. Cause I was just surprised at how dark it all was compared to once again, the universal monster movies, which are most of my experience uh, for this time period. Like I said, when they, I read it this morning, I'm pretty sure he smashed under a stone in the, in that's the, awesome. I'll tell you, they, they take him, bury him in a little matchbox. You can just read it online. I'm assuming. I, yeah. Right? Yeah. You can read it online. I, I, uh, I formatted a copy for my Kindle this morning. So if you want, I, I can, find that and not send it to you and break the law yeah <laughs> exactly right yeah don't, don't declare that here i don't know i'm playboy in the 50s i don't know is there copyright on that i don't know but but i tell you um the um you share it you know the cronenberg one mel brooks and company said don't hold back do what you want 
I can't imagine that conversation happened with a producer in 58. Like, don't hold back, right, you know, right. show the blood spilling out of the smasher, you know, like I just find like, what was the, where were the meetings? I, I assume from hearing the documentaries and the commentary that it, the film, even though it was sort of an A production right. flew under the radar, like a C production because no one, no one would allow that. <laughs> well, and I feel like then. 20th century Fox is kind of embarrassed by this. What were you gonna say, John? No, well, first, it did start as a low-budget B-movie with like a $100,000 budget, but then Fox really liked the idea and upped it to like three or 400000 So they were behind it. And I think in the 50s, this was, you know, monster movies were, were a big thing, and they were yeah. going to make a color one. So I think the studio heads were all behind it, and they were just being really faithful to the story. Um, the things that were cut were, I think, cut due to more technical and time like the different makeup and stuff um because i think hedison at one point wanted to have the progression we see the progression and they're like no we're making one mask that's it <laughs> um but I, I also think that the ending which is parodied over and over and over again in time when i watch it today i think it's still as effective now as it was then even though vincent price and the, and the other the lieutenant were just fitting with giggles throughout that whole scene that is probably one of the most tragic endings and i think he had to die because if what were they going to do if they would have saved right. him right the fly his, his other half is dead is gone yeah yeah so i mean it's a fitting in and again it teaches don't screw around with science well, my wife walked into the room just as that was happening. And she's like, why aren't they saving him? Why aren't they saving him? <laughs> like they do just kind of like stand there and go, oh man, that spider's really closing in on him. I don't know what yeah, we're going to do. When, when you think about it, what if you actually came across no, the web absolutely. and you saw that, yeah, you would be in such yeah. in shock. Okay. So yeah, I, I think it's it's pretty effective. And then your first impulse is just to smash it. That didn't I happen. Really I don't want to see that. You know, uh, Aaron, speaking of wives, um, I watched The Fly, rewatched it for this pod, and I had headphones in. So my wife was on one couch, I was on the other couch, she was listening to music and not paying attention to the movie. But, you know, slowly, as the movie is going along, she her eyes keep drifting to it, you know, and as he reveals himself to be The Fly... Somebody's having an emergency with that siren. Yeah, That's right. and someone, um, someone just got smashed. Uh, somebody just got smashed, smashed <laughs> on the street. Sorry, it's New York but for you. Yeah. By the time that end scene came around, she actually made me unmute it to watch it, and she's like, "Oh my god, that is horrible. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, horrible. it's really shocking." Do you guys think they could have? Because I was thinking that, I'm like, well, I don't know. Say they did save him. Could they reverse it? Once again, this gets back to the question: of, Is his mind? What's it? Where's his mind? Because they do do it later in the. Um, you know, in the second movie, but like he has more, <laughs> I, I feel like, I, I, I mean, not nah, the second movie is a lot more involved. Plot -wise, I, I, but he's think? dead. Like yeah. his other half is dead. Yeah. Like maybe yeah. he was alive. I mean, it's all yeah. like we were joking about it being BS science. Like anything could happen, I guess, but it really wouldn't make sense for the internal logic of the fly movie, given that he's died. I think uh, he, knowing that he can't get the, the fly back in the story. He decides to throw himself through in reverse a couple times. And then the cat that got lost ends up getting mixed in with him on the other way. It's like, Oh, there's the cat. It's mixed into your G DNA now. Dummy. Um, you, you know, that cat thing with the cat, you can hear the meow, but he oh, doesn't man. know where the cat went. That is spooky so as hell. Creepy. And so great. But I also wonder well, where's the cat's voice box? Like, there's yeah, just science that like, questions. <laughs> like, I'm like, how is this working? But I still loved it. I still I, it, it, in in so, the fly too, they do kind of imply that they can use it as a gene splicer. If he takes another human, he can the parts that he's missing, he can steal from the other human, which yeah. is what they do at the end. So, I mean, depending the, on how technical you want to get, there could have been an out for him. But you know, are you we should about the fly too. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about yeah. The, the fly. Yeah, the, we should clarify for the listening audience here because we're doing <laughs> a lot of spoilers. That's okay. It's a seventy years old movie or whatever. But point is, um, there's the fly, and then there is Return of the Fly and Curse of the Fly. So that's yep. like three direct movies that, yeah. and, and and you know, the third one ends with, "Are we going to make another?" Question mark. Um, 
Then there was the remake uh, two decades later and a direct sequel to that remake. So there's That's really right. kind of two worlds uh, yeah, sure. split there, two ideas about how this all works. And of course, you know, the later ones uh, is probably a little bit more or a lot more grounded, but that doesn't make the earlier ones not horrifying. So that's yeah, kudos right. to them. So, well, and, and if you don't mind, let, I mean, let us lean into return of the fly uh, because it is a, as you say, it's a direct sequel. It came out the following year. Really? I mean, so clearly, yeah, it was, ba- you know, it was, spurred on by the success of uh the 58 fly so but it's set rushed... 20 years later so. <laughs> it's 15 15 years later but oh my anyway so yeah it's 1973 in this uh in return of the fly i did not realize that okay yeah because the sun is all grown up now and you're like wait a minute so it's... is the is the is the car with the push button <laughs> transmission supposed to be futuristic or did that just exist back then now i i'm wondering if i missed oh let's it. just let's just it's start with the nitpicking on this movie no, i'm not nitpicking it no just, no yeah. we must we must nitpick because this movie is just I mean, begging to be i'm like did anybody even watch the first movie because like the lab which is suddenly was, in the foundry instead yeah, of at the base. It's like, well, wait, it's a, it's a different house lab. Uh, they go to the original lab and they realize it's all destroyed from the first movie. It's been kept as a museum sort of for the family of the folly of this thing. <laughs> Torture <laughs> themselves. But he's, I think he's planning on stealing some equipment, but there's a guard and he wants to bring it to his new lab, which is in this foundry. Uh, but they look almost like the same set, so it's a little no. Weird. It's, it's, it's weird that they're so close to each other, and because the sets are the same, and like yep. they just like like didn't, didn't watch the smash, movie. <laughs> didn't he smash all of that? And the fact that like his son is like, I've been following my father's <clears throat> records. I'm like, wait, the ones he explicitly burned and made sure there was no evidence of. I mean, I feel like it, that time jump thing was pretty common back then. If you look at the uh, <laughs> Mummy sequels from Universal. That's exactly what I was thinking. Like yeah. I, what yeah. year are they technically in? By yeah, the by the end one? of the Mummy series, I think. 1995, like I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, it's 95. <laughs> okay, oh, I'm sorry. Wow. I didn't mean yeah. to exaggerate by Well, Friday years. the 13th is all jacked up, too. Same yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's on like a Simpsons sort of timeline. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. But, you know, uh, Return of the Fly actually is satisfying despite the fact that that it is its own thing. Now, I don't mind them. It feels like two movies. It feels like we want to do something new, so we're going to have this noir mystery and this backstabbing thing in the lab, and we're going to you know, de-emphasize the love story a little bit. We're going to have uh, these legacy characters, but then it's like, well, you got to have the guy with the fly head. So right. they, they jump through major hoops to recreate the, <laughs> the fly mistake to the point where you're like, is this like... But you know, hey, it's a cash grab, and, it and as as far as they go, cash grabs go. It's not the worst cash grab I've seen. And it's Cannibal Run too. It being a sequel, it's like we're gonna have a fly head, hand, and a foot this time too. Damn and it, his head's gonna be bigger. <laughs> I Bigger's appreciate. Better. I appreciate that he did not get turned into the fly by his own stupidity because. <laughs> that would have been really just fresh. Like he gets thrown in there because of, you know, criminal shenanigans. Like if he was just like, well, I'm going to go do what my dad did. I would be. Oh, my God. Right. But yeah. So I, I appreciated that, even though like, yeah, you had to kind of work to like, oh, there's oh, a fly in there. Yeah. Right. And and I'm going to take it. I'm going to put it in there because you're you're afraid of flies, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, we should. We should have put like they they. they I think in these movies, a couple times they were like, "Is it his mind or the mind of a bloodthirsty fly?" Uh, flies aren't really blood. No, right? Predators. The murderous, the murderous <laughs> brain of a fly. I'm like, yeah, because flies are such predators. Yeah, flies don't know? kill kill like things. Scavengers, like, really. I think. Yeah, yeah they, they they eat trash and sugar and like they they're not. That's not the way they are. Like they should have picked like a praying mantis or yeah. like a dragonfly or you know yep. something like that. Well, that'd be a harder costume there, Eli. So I don't know if they do that. <laughs> you know, I, I like the conceit of a common house fly destroying somebody's um, humanness. And that's really in the Cronenberg one. But it yeah. still kind of works here. The thing about um, the return of the fly is it really is a it's funny watching it, even though it's set later, like it was made later. It feels like a movie from the 40s. It feels like mm. even maybe the black and white adds to that or the stock music that they use, but it feels so old fashioned compared to the first movie, even though it came after. 
Well, um, I was yeah. going to say, this movie to me feels like a 1957 movie where they're making every single atomic monster movie they can. And we don't, and I, in some ways, I mean, that's the thing I like about this movie is that it's a great monster movie. And I think it kind of, I'm in your camp, Dan, like, I think it, it really suffers in comparison to the original. Like if it was just a straight up monster movie about a guy who like teleports himself and gets turned into a, you know, a guy, a beast with a fly head, I'd be like, I'm on board, but it's coming off of this like legit mm -hmm. great film. And, and this feels like the, the cheap carbon copy that it is. I think to the, Go ahead, John. Say something. I dare you. Yeah. Oh, John, do you like? Do you love the sequel? John, John, I've had this discussion for twenty years now, <laughs> and and the reason that I am a big fan of this, I'm not going to say that it's better than the first one or that it's not full of flaws. Or that it's good, really. It is good. Here's like the thing: it. when I when I first saw this, I was a kid, and if you're a kid watching a monster movie. You want a monster, and this has I, I got agree. a humdinger of a monster. So, and if you want to talk about, well, how is he walking around and nobody see him? Watch the Mummy movies again. So, <laughs> right, right. let's we'll take that off the table. I, but I believe it's that a, people don't people aren't observant. So I believe. Well, it. no, and and as a kid, <laughs> you got a big big ass monstrous head. I mean, that is terrifying. Yeah. The the scene with the guinea pig I love the fact or, that the, or the rat. Shoot I like the fact the cops are shooting at him and they say, well, I didn't see him clearly. I'm like, really? You didn't see the guy you were shooting at with the oh, giant fly well, head. Sh should we bring up stormtroopers? Jesus Christ. They can't <laughs> hit the side of a barn. But anyway, anyway the, the guinea pig. Yes. The part with the guinea pig or the rat or whatever that was. Yeah. I think it was the guinea pig yeah. that scared the crap out. Yeah. Of oh my God. That's, that's insane. When he gross. steps on it and you see the human hands as cheesy as it looks. That terrified me no, as a freaky, kid. Yeah, I, I think too. Uh, what I was gonna say too is, I just get a little. Once again, I get a little bit bored by the kind of convoluted plot. Of the second one, I mean, it's not, it's not hard to follow <laughs> necessarily. It's just like, okay, there's like, a, there's money laundering kind of or something, and like there's a spy. But I will say, I mean, I do agree with, with John as far as the creature effects go. I mean, there's something about the texture of the fur oh, that was really absolutely. matted and gross looking. And the fly head. He's got to hold his head all the time. It yeah, just like, looks bad. Oh, I don't. I mean, I, I do like in the the way the head is. I mean, it's so big, you can really see the details of every little fly hair coming out, which is really true. gross yeah, to me. I, when we were um, we lived in Atlanta before we moved to New York, and I smashed this huge house fly that was flying around, and it was flying really slow. And once I smashed it, I realized, oh, it's going slow because it was pregnant. Because when I smashed it, like oh. live maggots came out, and I could just see the, you know, the little bristles on its legs and just all that. And so when I was Jeez. watching the second one, even though it is a little silly, the head is so big and detailed. I kept thinking about that. I'm like, oh, I really can see these details, and they're and they're lingering on it for a while. And it wasn't like the thing where it lingered on it, and it looked dumber to me. It lingered on it, and I kept noticing more things, and it kind of skewed me out. Even though I do like the first one a lot better than the second one, yeah, you know, I, mean, uh, I will say the fly actually does some killing in this one too, which yeah. makes the fly oh, yeah. a better monster. Because well, the, the fly is becoming a monster, and they stop him before he kills. But in this one, like he is the most innocent dude turned monster. He's not like his father who has got like, the murderous you know, brain of the fly. Yeah, yeah. He, he wasn't all hubris, so like you get to see him turn monster, and so when he's running around killing people, it is more effective, because you're like, damn, this guy didn't deserve this at all, whereas the other one, it's like, yeah, you put your family cat in the microwave, asshole. <laughs> like, I do I do have to point out, though, and then I'll throw it to you, Darren, uh, is that he's also psychic, because somehow he's aware of the laundering thing, and like he goes and meets the guy's face, yeah. and I'm like, what? How does, How does he, he even know that guy exists? He doesn't even know that he, guy. He did see his partner outside that guy's place, so it's not okay. completely. I'll trust you, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, He's that guy. Six cents of a fly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I love that scene in the mortuary, but it, it kind of occurs to me maybe there was a character that was cut because, like, he goes to the guy's office and says, I can sell you the secrets of teleportation, line up some buyers. 
I'm going to do this scam. I'll pay off my debts. You'll love it. And then the next thing I know, the guy runs a funeral home and he's doing uh, embalming. <laughs> and I'm like, well, he's like a nobody, right? Before he seemed like he was a somebody. So I feel like there's a third character they didn't want to cut out there. By the way, side note, I live in LA and there are no insects in LA. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, uh, what about uh, movie agents and producers? Am I right, well, guys? Right? Real well, blood suckers. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're just reptiles. Yeah. Yeah. But I love it. I love it because I, even though I'm not, I don't have a fear of flies. I do yeah. have a fear of insects and um, particularly bees and wasps. They're not here. Um, so. You should uh, start watching videos of insects up close. Like they're like micro. Uh, I got phase four. It's all good. Um, so. But like I, you'd start to kind of relate. They're actually not that bad. They're just like us. Bugs is cute. That's cool. <laughs> I, all right. Now, can, can we talk really quick about like the giant? I have a bug fear. The, the her gigantism or whatever they, they call it giantism <laughs> which i'm like really uh but like why like that pay, that goes nowhere like it's just like let's make a giant guinea it's all pig. in the math and the programming they 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 had to tweak their math they got it fixed or at least they thought and Simple and i and and kind of speaking to the cheapness of it yes I'm, and this is kind of, again it's a movie kind of at odds with himself because it's shot in cinemascope but it's shot in black and white it's got this amazing fly head, but it's got the chintziest, like his little head on the fly, which is clearly like oh, a fly postcard. <laughs> and, I'm just, and it doesn't have like a fake arm or leg. It's just like, like they didn't even bother. And I'm like, come on guys, give it. And that's where I go. Like, it just feels very slipshod. It doesn't feel like they put a lot of effort into the script uh, or the effects. It's just kind of like, let's make a big giant part uh, Mardi Gras mask for him to wear well, and give him a big, big hand and a foot this, and send him on his way. All right. Was it the same people for the second, for the return of the fly as the fly? No. Well, Not the same no, director. No. Well, in his defense, no. he had great source material for the first one. The second one, he was by the seat of his pants. He was. The story is that, so Robert Lippert was the producer that bought the rights. And once 20th century Fox got involved, he got outed. So he wasn't really involved in the sequel other than being a, executive producer or something 20th century fox didn't want to make a sequel but he had he owned the rights for later day sequels so he, it went back to basically what he is known for doing and that's low budget b movies mm -hmm. so that's why it's in black and white they had an original script that was apparently different because that's how they got vincent price to come right. back so that he liked it but by the time they actually shot it it was not the script <laughs> that price had liked so otherwise I don't think he would have been in it. Do you know, I mean, you all know a lot more about the, the lore of the old movies than I do. I know the 86 one is um, a lot different, obviously than the 58 one. Although, like I said, you can see strands of its DNA throughout all three of these films. Was the fly two in the eighties meant to be kind of a direct remake of return of the fly, just in the fact that it's his son. And I mean, I know they're different, Apparently but not like Frank, Frank Darabont, who was one of the screenwriters on that, like he deliberately didn't watch Return of the Fly, mm, okay, and then it turned out to be <laughs> Son of the turned out to be Son of the Fly anyway. And I mean, that was the thing. Like when Fly Two came out, I was like, "Oh my God, don't do it! Don't do it! Don't give her!" <laughs> oh, okay, so she's got the baby. Fine, here we go. That's funny. It's so much weirder than I anyone <laughs> should expect. I love that movie. Well, I want to talk about we, Curse, but before sorry. we talk about Curse, though, we got to back up just in in time to say what what are people's thoughts about Vincent Price in these two fly movies? Cause he wasn't yet a big horror star. He'd done house of wax and then basically hadn't worked, you know, until uh, this one came back around. Uh, he hadn't done much and uh, certainly wasn't a big horror star, but this was kind of the beginning of his legacy because he did this and then he did uh, the Tingler for William Castle. And he did Return of the Fly, and then House on he Haunted did, Hill. And that was yeah, House on Haunted Hill. And then he finally did uh, uh, Fall of the House of Usher in '60. That kind of that was he became the crown prince of horror. But in this movie, uh, specifically in Return of the Fly, I don't think he's he feels mightily adrift. Like I don't I don't know what he thinks he's doing. Like I think he's kind of terrible in it. Uh, he's kind of like shaking his head, like during the funeral, well, during his narration. He I'm like, have a character. I, well, no. that's what I'm saying. Like, because like, like in the first one, he's this guy who's in love with his his sister in law. Which, oh man, Jerry Springer, that shit. But <laughs> um, 
but like it's it's a compelling once again back to how eccentric people are in a great 50s monster movie every character has some kind of very weird eccentricity and so like yeah. he's this like puppy love sick guy who just lost his brother and he's trying to defend this innocent woman so he has like sort of a character arc in that first one and then you get right. to the second one and he's like don't mess with it and that's really all he's got <laughs> like, and then he and then he completely jumps in he's like well i'll help you then if also, you have to <laughs> also where'd all the money go like he says we don't have the money to back it and i'm like wait a minute just like uh, uh, oh i thought he was lying right because he's he's like got a business and they they have okay. a maid and stuff like i i bought it it was fine <laughs> yeah i mean he doesn't have a lot to do uh what he does is serviceable and it feels like a very workmanlike day for him yeah. it's not um, price, there, it's, it's not a it's not a passion project and you can feel no. that in the performance and and his readings but you know i he's got moments that opening funeral in the rain. I think he's really good in that first oh, scene, I, but he doesn't have much like beyond that. Yeah. Well, also that we have the, like the discrepancy of like, it, again, speaking to the fact that they didn't watch the first film before they wrote the screenplay, but like the idea of like, he has, I've always had this fear of flies. The sun says it's like, you used to literally collect them in the previous film. Like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> Kids sometimes don't remember, like, he was, like, what, five in that? Some kids don't remember back that <laughs> yeah. far. And so, like, ah, but the audiences do, especially yeah, if it was just last that, year. He has that trauma, so, like, I, I I could buy that he believes that he has always had a fear of flies, and then we know the root for that fear. You know, I, I think, that, though, I, you know, Aaron, I'm going to just say, back then, the people probably saw the fly. A year went by in their lives. They went to see Return of the Fly. There's no video cassette. They didn't revisit the movie. It hadn't been on television yet. They had no idea what the plot was in the first one. I grant that. However, when like, I don't think they, they have amnesia to the point that they don't remember that the little kid was collecting flies. And that was the whole deal was them looking for the white headed fly. I didn't even think about that aspect. And I watched these like two nights apart. So. Well, now you'll never be able to think about it again. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think the movie is a uh, uh, still a good monster movie, despite all of this. No, it's I it's, agree. It, it's all it is is a good monster movie, and again, I think it suffers in comparison to to its its lineage. It's no yeah. worse than Pleiades Blancas or anything that came out around that time or whatever. <laughs> well, that's so, right, exactly. But we don't think of those as good movies. We it think is of those conservatively one. We think of those as fun movies. It's sure. conservatively one hundred percent better than Citizen Kane. <laughs> you know why? That. it has a monster that's right that's right uh let us let us indeed now press on to curse of the fly unless you had something to say eli no i'm excited about curse of the okay. fly because okay. it's the I most you, exciting I you gyrating it's can the i the most exciting and the most disappointing of yeah. these movies because it starts out with that surreal scene of that woman running and like escaping the uh uh, uh in i guess insane asylum is that even yep. like how we should say that these days uh uh it's what they called it super surreal uh it feels like a hammer movie like yeah. it feels like you're watching a hammer like a hammer the fly and then it's got so many interesting things going on with the people but then it it doesn't have a fly in it. There's no really, fucking fly. Kid. That's Sorry, really guys. upsetting. <laughs> it's like, really, really upsetting. It is but curse of the fly. Up, I looked it up. Like I was like, fly man, there's something. This has something that I really like about it, and it's also not delivering something I really want. But I looked it up, and the that was the director's first horror film. This is the same director uh, who did uh, Kiss of the Vampire for Hammer, which is one uh, of my favorite Hammer sure. movies. It's a great movie, great. Um, which I so, thought preceded this one. I think. It, uh, this that was, was 63. Oh, that Curse was 65. It's um, the Vampire 63, looks like. I thought it was oh, yeah. It is, but then he also did Witchcraft, which I think he did for Lippert right before this one. Okay. Anything so I said wrong, blame Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm just going to cut it out, so we'll never see it. Oh, yeah. I, I know everything. <laughs> No, I no. You I let it roll, up. man. I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, I had no idea who he even was. But I love that movie, and uh, there's there's something really different about this one. It feels oh, like a, sure. I mean, it's a British horror film, um, which well, I don't know what the story is on why it ended up being a British horror film, but it was immediately detectable to me. Um, yeah, I think they had the wrong title, but they had to use the fly title because of for obvious reasons. But again, this is. The grandsons, yeah, yeah, but, but not... again, you 
you, or or is Don Levy his? Wait, brother, Don Levy's or, the grandson, no, right? It's, I was reading about this, so they it's supposed to be the grandsons, but they they get the names wrong. I think they use like the son's name to refer to the grandfather, or son, but then they use well, a yeah. picture. They say the grandfather's the Andre, and then you know there's uh, Philippe, and then we've got Don Levy. So there's like four generations of, yeah. of Delambres here going on. So and they but keep if using you, the wrong names and yeah, I don't know. If you take the obvious what the hell are we doing here <laughs> out of it, I think it's still a good story for what they're trying to do with the teleportation devices. Yeah. And yet after two or three or nine generations, they still have yet to figure out how to get it to work right. <laughs> um well it's because it's in secret. Can't talk about it. Well, that's true. And and at least they've moved on. They're not using guinea pigs or animals. They're just using people. So they have, you know, <laughs> progressed. Um, but as Don Levy says, and it's my favorite line in the whole movie, is we're scientists. We do things we hate. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, it's that for is the money. Funny. It's for the glory. Yeah. I do wonder where the QA person is throughout all this, but if I can tell you just like my introduction to curse of the fly, um, I couldn't find it. And this is, I, I bought the screen factory box set and, and thoroughly enjoy it. Everyone should buy it. Um, it was uh, very entertaining and packed full of extras quality box set. But before I bought it three weeks ago, um, you guys told me curse of the flies on YouTube. Check it out. I had never seen the film. I fired it up and I started watching it and that opening shot with the glass breaking a woman in her underwear crawling out of a, a window in slow motion running through the forest as the credits play it, And you know, the YouTube version is a bit grindhousey. It's definitely a transfer from film and um, all the way through to reading the placard that says psychiatric hospital. I thought that's, that is literally like one of the greatest opening scenes I think yeah. I've ever seen. And, yeah, and it, it felt great. so modern and so dangerous and so weird because of the slow motion. I know other films used it, but I felt like I was watching Dementia 13 or something. Like it was, it was so avant-garde that I was wondering, where's the movie going to go from here? And it, it did go to interesting places and it felt a little bit like, uh, if if Night of the Living Dead had already been made, it would have gone a little further, but this was a few years before, so it played it a little safer, but it still had some of that same grittiness to it. And yes, it's a British version of that, but but I that opening two minutes, I got to say, of all yeah. five films, I was literally blown away by the opening of that movie. And I, I, I don't think it ever got there again, but that doesn't matter. It still got some really good stuff, like all the stuff with the creepy guys in the uh, barns. Like that was like on that level. So there was enough there that I was like, no fly. I'm good with it. It's still pretty horrifying. This is a film that took forever to even come out on VHS. So yeah. I had seen the first two multiple times. You're waiting to try to find a copy of this because it wasn't playing on TV or at least not that I could find. So when it find when you finally had a, a chance to see it, if you get over the fact that this is not like the other two, I still think it's a pretty compelling story. Don Levy is still a scientific asshole, which yeah. he does really well. <laughs> but the end near the ending where the two bodies come through as one. Oh man. Oh man. Is is, oh, is it exactly axe, yeah. is exactly what a kid would be thinking if you had a teleporter going, I wonder what if you did this. Yep. We got to see oh, yeah. that and it is haunting. I and I will say too, I and I'll admit I was I was a little cold in Curse of the Fly. I think because that opening is so surreal, it's like something like you said, you would see in Hammer, even like a Lynch film. And then it just kind of once more gets into kind of gobbledygook with all this unnecessarily complicated plotting. Although the atmosphere is very cool. Like it did have yeah. this kind of autumnal gothic atmosphere with all the, you know, the freaks mm -hmm. and the tombs and everything, which is cool. Um, I will say my ears and eyes kind of pricked up when we saw that conjoint or that blended person because that to me felt like the most Cronenbergian kind of thing. I think that's why I mean when I go, Oh, I, I can spot little inspirations here and there. And once again, I don't know if Cronenberg saw curse of the fly. Maybe he didn't, but that to me actually felt like the biggest tie to the 1986 fly, even though it comes in the film that doesn't have a fly at all in it. <laughs> Just right, that right. mound of gelatinous flesh. 
Well, I can well, I can understand if somebody had said we're going to remake The Fly. What do you think of David Cronenberg? Anybody who had seen Curse of the Fly would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, exactly, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. that guy. Well, if we if we I mean, kind of going back to what you were saying, Darren, about the whole you know good women being you know kind of subterfuge. I mean, this is like gaslighting 101 like this whole movie is just a bunch of men lying to women and you're just like wow like but all and like and they don't blink like don that, levy don levy's so good at just like saying nope that didn't oh happen. yeah totally he kind of reminded me a little bit of uh uh who's the guy who played the werewolf uh oliver reed or no, no, Lon Chaney. Lon Chaney. He kind of reminded me of Lon, Lon Chaney and his, yeah. his, yeah, Lon Chaney Jr. and his loafiness. But that scene <laughs> where she, they're totally lying to her, which is a terrible thing to do to somebody who already thought they were nuts and is right. now realizing they're not. Um, it, it's such an interesting arc. And then she finds that broken glass, which she thought she dreamed. Um, that's that's like a cut above dramatic yeah. reading of a third sequel, you know, or whatever second sequel. Well, and you also, you know, like like uh, the the house servant Ty is also, or no, Juan. Sorry, Taiwan. Really, guys, come on. Ty, <laughs> uh, man, the, the, also the yellow uh, face. Is just, yeah, uh, well, so bad. I mean, yeah. So bad. Well, Bert bad. Bert Kwok is actually of Asian origin. Oh, he, understood. I'm talking about uh, no, the the girl, right? The one who plays uh, Juan. Uh, but yeah, she's got like a whole thing of like she's like letting Judith out and she's like, you know, creating the, she's putting the, the, the frame there. It's like, she got, you got Juan gaslighting her over here, like trying to drive her crazy. And you got the guys, I'm just like, Oh man. And she just got out of an insane asylum. So well, no he, they do say it was it. there they just because it. she had a, a panic attack, like essentially <laughs> like, like yeah. right. I, so I, I, I rewound that scene like three times. I was like, like, wait, why was she there? She was stressed out about a piano. Yep. That, like, that's not fair. A kid gets stressed. Like, it's well, and nobody's got can... emotions. Give her a lobotomy, which is what they did in the sixties. Like, it's not. It's not even a joke. It's honest. Like, but it's horrifying. Well, I love that scene um, where um, the woman is putting her hand through that barn door, and one of the freaks grabs her hand, and she's like, "You're hurting my hand." Judith, like, that's very scary. You know that whole um, the whole like like pen of people who'd been disfigured by these teleporters um i thought that whole concept was brilliant like this woman marries into this this like bizarre rich family like i i think the only thing that would have like what would have made this movie a movie that i thought was really great was wait well get rid of the yellow face and (laughs) uh like have the freaks actually be somehow fly related instead of just like weird fleshy people with pantyhose on their face yeah but how are you gonna put a fly in the transporter a third time it's just well that's just it by this time they learn they learn not to make sure there's no damn fly in there where there's a writer there's a way and uh (laughs) (laughs) well here's here's my question like i mean did it have to be curse of the fly like what i mean at this point like we're we're it's 65 you know like we're talking about eight years later like certainly the idea of transmitters you can't copyright that concept, can you? The idea, they, like, we're going to transport you from you place can. to place. But they also deal with the fact that the the grandson still has like residual fly DNA, which oh th- just makes him kind of slimy and wet, <laughs> which is like disappointing because I thought he was going to turn into. I thought like, oh, this guy is doing yeah, like Wolfman transformations into the fly when he locks. He is himself. the yeah. bundle fly, and, right? And then, that we're going and then it. like Eric Stoltz gets that treatment later and they do it yep. right. And it's like, Oh, that's gross. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. I, you know, I like it better than return of the fly, although not like leaps and bounds, but I don't mind that there's not a fly because those creatures are so George Romero. So I feel like I'm still getting yeah, horror, sure. you know, stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I like the way it's filmed. I like the use of library music. I like, uh, um, several scenes towards the climax are really interesting. I like how the cop kind of starts off as he's the person who's doing the bidding of the insane asylum, but then turns into kind of his own guy and figures it out like way ahead of time, even that the insane asylum people are not quite legit. So I kind of, you know, had some empathy for different characters. The, you know, the performances were I think better than return of the fly just generally. Um, And uh, you know, even though, you never marry somebody you just met is like crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but I guess it happens. I guess it happens. So you never know. 
works the ending, we won't spoil the ending, but I mean, I think the ending is um, like when when they're transporting. The brother, yeah. I'm just like, oh, like, I mean, like, it's truly tragic. And, and I hadn't expected that, you know, at that point for such a weird movie that it's hard to get emotionally involved in it. And yet that, that payoff is great. It's so good. When the brother won't answer his question on the phone. Uh, that's like, that's like out of a modern film. It's so tense where he's like, no, no, just, just listen. And the other brother is just talking over him. And he's like, this is important information. You know, <laughs> and it really is. And people say monster movies are immature. Yeah. No, I, I do I think like there's dramatically good stuff in there. I do like the fact that it's very different of an ending because the son that's in the, the place that they're trying to transmit to in London. Yeah. He's like, I'm done. No, seriously, I'm done. I just trashed this. I'm done. Yeah. And they're like, okay, well, we're sending it over. And he's like, <laughs> uh. <laughs> but I, I do find it funny that they can't seem to figure out how to mail a passport. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you can't. Oh, my God. If yeah, I don't have my I, passport. I, well, you'll but get it a won't, fine. It, it won't have the stamps, so you know. Okay, so you're gonna get a fine. <laughs> I, how about I lost my passport, dude? I totally thought of that. Like, I'm yeah, like, the, just the send the passport, him the passport subplot. Just, just stupid. send it to him. It's, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. But, but aside from that, I, I do think the characters are. I mean, Don Levy is. Just, he's again that that driving. He doesn't care about it. it's science. We're gonna do this. Why the brother is aging every now and then? No yeah. idea. Nope. Um, but well, the, flies the only ending, live for a couple. You know. A well, that's true. So. That's true. But the fact that the other brothers changed totally changed character. Not changed character, but went what we didn't expect because you mm -hmm. know they're all scientists. They're going to stick together, and he's like, "I'm out of here. Fuck this." All right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. We will definitely be getting this gang back together again. I, I'm thrilled that uh, we all got to hang out and talk about the, the old and the new and the in-between. So until next time, keep searching, keep exploring, and keep sharing the scare. Mm -hmm.